Matthew 25. And so I want to begin or continue the message this morning from Matthew 25 and the parable of the talents. And I want to read that passage with you. Because I, I did something interesting this week. I'll let you give you a chance to turn to Matthew 25. Um, I was going through the, the last five days of your 40 days of stewardship. Thank you, Denise, for bringing that up. And, and I trust you've been able to read those scriptures. As I read the scriptures this week, I, I, was, uh, I always do that. These, these last few weeks I've been reading the five to seven days that uh, are identified for the coming week. And, and I thought, okay, Lord, um, just speak to my heart. And I would just read through those scriptures. Where do you want us to go this week? And I'll tell you, as I read the five days for this Sunday, um, I didn't have anything settle on my heart. And then I started thinking, okay, um, what's the theme of this week? And I noticed that the theme for your devotions this week in the 40-day journey is, is investments. And so I started asking myself this question. Lord, I want to look at these scriptures again in these five days. And Lord, what does your word say about investments? Now, I've got to tell you, when that, when that message kind of uh, settled on my heart, it, it just kind of hit flat. Because I thought, the last thing I want to do in this pulpit is just give my, my people investment strategies. You don't want to talk to me about investment strategies. I told my family, I says, if we're going to invest any money and put money away for retirement or whatever, I'm going to call somebody who really knows what they're doing because I'm going to give them whatever money we can and let them take care of it because I just don't make good choices in that part of my life. And so when I started looking at the scriptures, what does the Bible say about what we're to do with our money as far as investing? I thought, this is a lightning rod question. Many Christians feel that if we just give everything away, that we're most honorable to God. And if we just live with a toothbrush and a comb, we'll be good. Well, that's not necessarily the picture that I see in the scriptures. And when I started thinking about investment principles and read the parable of the town, if you look at it as we read this passage now, from a standpoint of how does God want people to have money use money, express their faith through money, if you look at this passage in light of that, all kinds of principles are going to jump out at you. And I want to walk through them with you this morning. So I'm reading from Matthew 25, beginning with verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two, and another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. I see, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have, done, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew I had harvested, so, so you knew that uh, I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone 
who has will be given more, and he will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken from him, and throw that worthless and, and throw that worthless servant outside in the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is quite a passage for us to consider this morning. Would you pray? With me? Lord, now, as we've read your word, we need help to discern what it really says. We need your assistance to speak to us, again, through our pastor and just through your Holy Spirit right here. Lord, say things that I cannot say. Say things that I don't even need to say so that I can have your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we uh, are, have these verses. Let me just kind of go through these verses uh, and just kind of recap uh, some of what's said here. For instance, in verse 14, I pick up the, uh, the, the principle of entrusting property to others. So there's this relationship where we trust each other to handle affairs in agreements back and forth. Uh, in verse 15, each is given responsibility according to their ability. Very interesting, isn't it? We all have varying abilities. We'll talk about that. In verse 16, it says there's, there's the five-talent guy. He goes at once, and he puts his money to work, and he doubles his money. Then the two-talent guy, he doubles his amount because of he was given to, he made to. And then verse 18, we have the one-talent guy who digs a hole. Hey, hey, at least he went out and got a shovel, you know. But he went the wrong way, didn't he? He dug a hole, he hid the money, and made nothing, thinking he was saving the talent. Verse 21 reveals to us the outcome for the well-done five-talent man, and then the, the, the benefits of the two-talent man in verse 23, and then verse 24 comes the judgment, right, of the one-talent man, the man who didn't have much. It says he was called, what, a wicked and lazy, lazy servant. Wow. Lazy servant here, of course, is described as a... A do-nothing kind of guy. And then this, this lazy, wicked servant, he has enough energy not to go out and invest, but he has enough to judge the master this, uh, that he is serving. He calls him hard. He calls him harvesting where he had not sown and gathering where he had not scattered. And we'll look at that a little bit too. And then in verse 27, we see this whole... Isn't it interesting, even in uh, the, the Greek times, the, the biblical times... We don't think about them having banks. They had banks. They had branches. I mean, I don't know what that looks like, you know. But there were branches. There were banks. There were loans. There was interest. There was compounded interest. Uh, these were not silly people. These were people that were knew, they knew what they were doing. So we have much to learn. Jesus is using this parable to speak to his culture that he was in, to his disciples especially, and here we have these many, many principles to live by. So let's walk through them. But let me give you some questions. I, I kind of had did a little research in my own mind just thinking, what are some of the questions that people are asking today? Because I, I think you are asking questions as I do. Like how much money is too much money in my savings account? How much is too much? That's a good question. Are we to give away our money and live by faith? Oh, we are called to live by faith. But how much money are we supposed to give away? Is, is, is true sacrifice to live with a few hundred dollars in our account and no more? Is that the litmus test of a faithful Christian? Or is it, or is it right to have a retirement account that grows by thousands and more? Is it right to have a pension? When it comes to helping others, is it right to loan money to people on interest? Is that honoring or dishonoring to God? People have different uh, perspectives on that, opinions on that. What if I were to own homes and rent them out? Would God be okay with me owning many homes if that was how I, I made a living? How would we feel about that? How do we think about others who live that way? And finally, the question came to me. Is it ungodly to have an abundance of wealth? Wow. We need to look at each of these questions, don't we? You see, frankly, even among believers, there are so many opinions 
And sometimes it's hard to navigate this stewardship stream of life. But the real question here that so many ask is this, and it's just where I kind of landed in this message. What do I do with my money, whether it is too much or too little? How do I honor God with my resources, my money? This passage this morning is our base conversation that includes some incredible principles for us to consider being stewards of God's resources in our life. So here we go. Principles of stewardship. I found six of them, and one of the points has some sub points. So I'm tricking you just a little bit. So, number one, we are to entrust goods and property to others. Look at verse 14. He called his servants and entrusted his property to them. So we are to have relationship with properties that can be uh, used for one reason or for another. I think of our own conference that exemplifies this. They have the ELP account. When I was pastoring at Linden and we relocated the church from in town to outside, right on the edge of town with 15 acres of property and, and just finding a new day, doing some different things. Uh, to this day, they run a daycare center out of uh, about half of the church. And, and it's a beautiful ministry to the, to the community, people in the church. There was lots of daycare workers in there. That was their core value as a church. And so we did that. And, and yet we had to borrow some money to finish the kind of facility that would work. And because some of you here today uh, invest in the ELF account, the savings account at the conference, the conference was able to loan money to us without literally having to go to a bank and doing all of the difficulties that it takes for a church to borrow money. Banks do not like to loan a churches money. And uh, there, I, I don't, there's a lot of reasons why we won't go there, but, but uh, uh, that's one example of how we have this trust, of how we uh, use each other, those who have, who have invested, to loan to others. Number, the second principle that I see here is in verse 15. The second part of verse 15. I saw this principle that we all have various abilities. In, in this verse 15, it says, each according to his ability. And God has given each one of you differing abilities, and so you know how to handle certain things in life. Some of you are lock, stock, and barrel quilt makers. You know how to make a quilt. You know how to help people with their goods. You know how to organize things in the shelf at the Harbor Impact, but maybe you're not so good in the area of finance. Another person, they are, they're really excellent with money, and God has gifted them to be able to handle large amounts of cash, and so they, they seem wealthy to us. They would have lots of money, but they're managing their money in such a way that they uh, are, are building God's kingdom in various ways. We can't always know people's personal stories. I think of the contrast of people that we have in our world today, and I immediately thought of my two grandsons. Uh, my two-year-old twin grandsons are living with us, and, and there's something that's happening in our home. When I come in the door, I was sharing with the men's group yesterday on this, uh, when I come in the door, um, I have someone meeting me. I have a personal butler. You didn't know that your pastor was a rich man. I am. I am richer beyond rich. Because when I come to the door, I can't even, I start to turn the handle on our door. And I know now not to open the door. Because if I stand there and kind of look through the glass, there's Trey, our maitre d. He takes, he opens the door. If I touch that door handle, he yells at me. And, and so I let him open the door. And if I have certain things in my hand, he has to take them. He takes my, my gloves and he puts them on the table. He takes my keys and he runs them and hangs them on the hook. He takes my coat and makes me gather him up and hang it up on the hook, lifting up his little body and hanging on the hook. And then when it, times, it comes time to take the garbage out, if he hears even the lid move on our garbage can, he comes a-running. And he just really has something to say. Papa, me? And you can just see a two-year-old taking a 20-pound garbage bag. We pack our bags hard, you know. That's good stewardship, you know. And so that also means we don't take the garbage out very often. You know? So he takes that garbage. I'll get it out of the can, and, and I'll tie it up so he can. Well, whatever. And, and he pulls that across the floor. 
and his mother doesn't know that at least once, <laughs> at least once, I, in his diaper, I let him take the garbage all the way out to the garbage can. And, but you don't have to tell her that. And, and that's Trey. And there's Tatum, the other son, the other grandson. And he's looking. He's just watching Trey. What are you doing? What are you doing? He's just watching. Guess who the leader in our home is? It's not Trey. It's Tatum. You would think just the opposite. Trey is such a doer. Did you know that when, whenever we do something new, when the, when the twins see something they can do new, Trey's like this. My doer, he's back like this. My grandson, he won't do it. Tatum almost always goes first. He likes to do it first. He's a leader. He's out there. He'll do something different. And he'll, he'll chart the path. And then when, uh, when Trey's looking at, uh, at Tatum, and Tatum has, has done something new, he's, he's cut a new path. He's done something really uh, important. Trey, of course, knows how to be a servant. And he goes, and he takes it. He yanks it out of Tatum's hand and says, me. And now he wants to do it. And then there's a cry, and you know how that goes. But Tatum's the leader. These grandsons of mine, they have differing abilities, and so do you and I. We need to let that breathe as the body of Christ. And as you see people in, in, in culture, uh, I, I can't imagine what it's like to own a personal business. I remember when I went over to the hardware store in uh, the, the lumber company down in Marysville, and they gave us some goods for our silent auction years ago. And no more than a year later, they closed their doors. And I wouldn't have known, walking in there as, as simply a purchaser, that for them to give me something, they were giving out of what they did not have. And they closed their doors. We cannot know the wealth around us. Be careful, we have various abilities. Number three, God gives all of us various trusts in life. I kind of have spoken to this a little bit already. In the first part of the same verse, verse 15a, he says, to one he gave five talents of money, to another two, and to another one. God gives us various trusts. I just want to say, why isn't that okay? Why does everyone have to receive 2.3 talents per person? You see, we live in a culture that sometimes says, you have too much, and this one has too little. I'm all about ministering to the poor, and we do. But God has given us various trusts, and we need to let Him do that. Let God breathe His will and way in a person's life. And know this, that if great wealth were to be misused, remember the other scriptures, and, and they're with us. God allows wicked people to have great amounts of money because all they do is hold it until they die. And then it gets passed on to someone else who might be more trustworthy. God knows how to hold us accountable. Let God do that. Number four, we get to decide how well we will do in life. This is going to take a, a few minutes. We get to decide how well we will do in life. You see, we are a talent holder. You might be thinking, uh, Pastor, if I have to pick the, whether I'm holding five, two, or one talent, I'm a one talent person. Uh, I just, I'm, I don't think I have much more in comparison than like that one talent guy. But dear friends, no matter what God has given you, you get to decide how well you're going to do in life. And here's our first thought. We can do great or we can do poorly. That is up to us. God does not keep us from doing great. I don't know if you have one dollar in your wallet. You can do something awfully good. In fact, we got to watch that movie a little bit last night. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but the guy who wins the lottery, uh, he actually has a, a lottery ticket. Put this away. He has a lottery ticket, and he doesn't have a tip for his cup of coffee with the lady at the restaurant, right? What's the name of that movie? It can happen to you. It can happen to you, yeah. And, and so... Uh, uh, he says, I don't have enough for a tip. She goes, okay, you don't have to pay your bill. Just get out, you know, kind of an attitude. He goes, no, I have enough for coffee. I have two bucks. It was two bucks for coffee. And he says, but I don't have a tip. 
And she's just like, whatever. I got to I'm busy. Get out. And he says, what if I got this lottery ticket? If this lottery ticket wins, I'll give you half of it. Well, some of you know the story. Uh, he wins $4 million. <laughs> He's an officer in New York City. This cop uh, wins $400 million. And his wife is not real happy that he had to give $2 million to this waitress. And so the, the conflict ensues in this, in this movie. But we get to decide whether we have one lottery ticket, and I'm not encouraging you to go buy one. But we have the opportunity to use our money the way God leads us to. And we see this all through. The, each talent person has the right to engage in investing or not. The second thing I see in, under number four is we have the opportunity to use money to make money. You see that? It's very clear. God allows us to use money to make money. Master, you've entrusted me with five talents, verse 20 says. See, I have gained 20 more. Albert Lowry set out to prove that it was easy to get rich quick in real estate with no money down, and he did just that. He wrote a 1980 book on how you can have nothing and use other people's money and become something. You see, I, have, I think we have to be careful that we don't use schemes to try to succeed in life because we can use others if we're not careful. His book was written, How You Can Become Financially Independent by Investing in the Real Estate and Have Nothing to Yourself. It was a bestseller. In May of 1981, uh, the cover story on Money Magazine, they estimated Lowry's worth at $30 million. $30 million he had earned. But something went wrong, and just five years later, the Success Development Institute that he founded went into bankruptcy, two and a half million in debt, and he lost it all. You see, we have the ability to take what we have not what we don't have, to take what we have and use it for God's glory. And we can invest in the things that makes a difference in His kingdom and in God's glory. Wow. The third thing that I see under number four is, is simply or foresee. We can harvest where we did not sow. You see that part of it? That took a lot of thinking. I didn't quite understand all of that. And here's my perspective. Money may come by your hard work. For some, it might come through a gift or an inheritance. Maybe some of you have received money that way. It doesn't matter to God. God wants you to use it as a faithful steward. Sometimes when we're doing something to be faithful to God, God says, you are so faithful with a little bit, uh, here's some more, because I know you're going to be faithful with it. And so we can. This is about what happens when people are already stewarding their life, do you see? Their principles of investment simply give dividends they never expected. And God wants to use us in that way. The second thought was very similar as we... We gather where we did not scatter. That's D. That's and, uh, and, and we found that in verse 24. Kind of the same principle that I saw there. And then E, we can invest and even make bank interest on our money. There's nothing in this passage that says, in fact, it encouraged the, uh, the one talent man, at least you could have put this money in a CD or a savings account, he says, and make a little bit of interest. These are simply points that we are stewards of God, God's money when we make money. I believe that God is calling each one of us, and I tell you, as serving in the East Michigan Conference as, as a pastor for all these years, some down in Southern Michigan, but mostly here in East, uh, we have had conference leadership that have held seminars after seminars that have taught us pastors and lay leaders how to put money away, how to prepare for the future, and it is not wrong. And that's kind of my message this morning. That when we take money and we have reasons, do you know that uh, uh, even some, uh, excuse me, I'm forgetting the name, but uh, uh, some teachers of stewardship would say, 
Why are you borrowing on car payments? Why, if you have the ability, start making payments to yourself and have fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in the bank and go buy a car cash. And it's kind of fun when you walk into a car place and you see the, the salesman fall over when he asks, You're paying cash? You don't need a loan? We got a really good loan plan here, you know. Because they make money on that too, right? No, I'll be paying cash today. And and they're just amazed because that just doesn't happen. It's not wrong for people to set aside money. Uh, you know, Dave Ramsey even talks about saving up money and buying a house. So what would it look like for one of us to say, I've got a savings account with $80,000 in it, and I just need another $10,000 before I can finally buy a house cash? Is it wrong to have that $80,000 in the bank? No. No, please don't do that to, to each other. I was talking with one of our uh, pastors here in the, in the community, um, at our association, and we just were talking, and it led him to say to me, he says, well, I have about a half a million dollars in the bank. Well, that's one rich pastor. But let me tell you the rest of the story. You know why that money's in there? So that he can retire. He has no pension plan. And his church gave him an allotment. Our denomination does it a little differently. I'm in a pension plan. And so his congregation has given him a, a, a set of money that they've encouraged him to take that three, four thousand dollars I don't know how much they gave him, each year and put it into a, a, an IRA. And he did. That's his pension so that he can retire. And, and so what's the difference between that and all the monies that you and our budget has faithfully put in a pension for our pastor? Is it that much different? I'm just telling you that there's a few ways that we can climb this mountain in being faithful to God. All I'm simply saying is that if God has given you reason to have large amounts of money and it has a purpose for His glory, or maybe you're sitting on some money and you're praying, saying, Lord, I want you to show me how you want me to use this. Let God do that and let our lives breathe in that way. Just two more and then we'll quit. Really, really quiet. Say amen. amen. Is everybody awake? Yeah. If they're not awake, just give them an elbow. All right. All right. Number five. People who invest in us will call us into account. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of these servants returned and, what does it say? Settled accounts with them. There's a settling of accounts. Don't worry about that. Let God take care of that. And our parable gives us that example. Too much is given, much is required. But don't forget the greatest concern of this parable. It's the person with the least to lose. God wants to teach us to be faithful with our finances, no matter how much we have or we don't think we have. Finally, number six. We will be rewarded but what we did with what we were given. We will be rewarded and we'll be held accountable. So that's number five. We'll be held accountable. Number six, we're going to be rewarded for what we did. And let me tell you, do you see anywhere in this passage, in this parable, where, where Jesus is saying, hey, now I want you to compare the five-talent guy to the two-talent guy and compare the two-talent guy with the one-talent guy. I want you to compare the one-talent guy with the five-talent guy. Does it say that? It doesn't say that. And how about we not do that? How about we just worry about what God has given us and be faithful with it and trust Him for it? You see, if you're not, care if you're not careful, we might be running the wrong race. Our ladder might be leaning on the wrong wall. We might be climbing and making something of our life for wrong reasons. Let me finish with this story. A woman was a world-class runner. She was invited to compete in a road race in Connecticut. On the morning that she was to race, she drove from New York City, followed her directions, or so she thought. Given her, her instructions, she received over the telephone. She got lost. She stopped at a gas station, asked for directions, and the gentleman says, I know of a race just up the road. It must be the one. She got to the, to the race uh, location, and she noticed 
that there weren't as many cars in the parking lot. And she said, this is a pretty, pretty big race, but I'm glad there's just a few cars. This might be an easy run for me. Because she knew that there was a prize, a cash prize for the winner of the race. That's how she lived. When she got ready for the race, just in time, she got in there and she, she raced and she won. She beat the, the closest guy by four minutes. It was so easy for her to run that race. But then came the time for the cash settlement for the winner, and that's when she realized she entered the wrong race. She hadn't found the race that she intended to find, and her cash prize was pretty tiny compared to what she thought she would receive. As we close this morning, please hear this, friends. As God's stewards of God's family, let us remember to run the right race. God's race, not our race. God's will, not ours. God's plan for redemption, not our self-preservation. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you speak to us about money in your word. Lord, last Sunday, I was amazed at just how effective I felt the message was. And Lord, I am really surprised. I can hear a pin drop in this room right now. I just pray that the word that I have preached would fall on fertile ground. That we would receive the truths of your word that we would, as people, not shy away from being faithful with our money. Honoring the Lord by bringing the tithe into the storehouse. Honoring one another by taking care of those around us when we feel led to, to give this or that to a person. And then, Lord, not judging one another. Help us, Lord. We are a judgmental world. We just have our, our opinions about people who have and people who don't. Lord, help us. Help us just to be faithful with what you've given us. Help us to be stewards of yours. Always be faithful. Thank you, Lord. We'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen.